Greetings, traveler. I am Sir Knox, the teller of tales. Would you like to hear one? Before we get started, please consider subscribing to the channel as it helps immensely. Also, if you'd like to leave a comment or like it, that also helps as well. Thank you. This one is called Nympho wants to make the game about themselves and brute force the GM into doing what she wants. How fun. This happened a couple of years ago and I'm still kind of bothered by it. For this story, I'm still in touch with one of the witnesses to this day. We were playing a NWOD crossover where we all would start as humans. The players were Michelle, my friend, Harry, Jesse, me, and finally, let's call them Cindy. Ah, Cindy the issue here. The whole point of the Chronicle itself was that we were going to explore some mysteries of the new world of darkness while eventually discover that our characters were supernatural beings. Sounds fun. Michelle was meant to become a vampire. Harry a changeling, Jesse a werewolf, I was going for the demon, and Cindy for the beast. Each one having their own splat books. Vampire the Requiem, Changeling the Lost, Werewolf the Forsaken, Demon the Descent, and Beast the Primordial. So, Cindy was hypersexual IRL and in game. She wanted to play as a beast Medusa, and in the first game things were smooth. The main problem was that Michelle had some rough experiences IRL, so she wasn't comfortable with someone being so hypersexual. We told Cindy and she had a literal breakdown, crying and wailing that it's my body and I do what I want, I won't let you censor me, yada yada yada, while tossing a temper tantrum. Michelle would have many panic attacks in between games due to Cindy's RPs, things like, oh, I grow up her boobs to compare sizes with mine's, and whenever we would demand Cindy to stop, she would start crying and threatening with self-mutilate themselves. Sounds like an absolute nightmare, honestly. Michelle tried to power through because I was in the game. Even if our character flirted, we never did anything in-game. It was more like our characters were in the puppy love stage. Sounds like you have two different extremes. And um, this isn't a game that should be played, obviously. Things derailed brutally due to two incidents happening in the same game. We were playing this scenario, for some reason the GM picked a Call of Cthulhu module to adapt for our game. We were fully aware that our characters were supposed to become supernatural somewhere down the line. But Cindy would constantly RP saying, I want to be a snake. The GM would give her options like, What do you mean your character is a human for now? I know, but being human is boring. I want to be a snake now. Me. Dude, our characters haven't changed yet. I don't care. I want to be a snake. Starts crying. Why did everyone limit me? Why did everyone keep me down from being what I want to be? That line was what really pushed the edge. Mostly because Cindy was trans, they would always try to push the people censor me for who I am as a defense mechanism. There was a lesser incident midway through game. Basically, I felt uncomfortable due to hearing an actual fight and screams in the background of the GM's microphone, and I decided to bail with Michelle. Time passed and Cindy asked me to run her a game of cult. I wasn't too comfortable with DMing them cult, especially since everything that was supposed to be horrible, disturbing, and traumatizing would sexually arouse Cindy. The stroke that broke the camel's back came one day when Cindy was flirting with her boyfriend, another player, and she decided to post her own nudes on our group chat with no warning whatsoever other than, look at me, I'm hot. I tried to talk to her, but again, she would break down, threaten to harm herself, and say that everyone was being rude and abusive to her due to her lifestyle. No, it's due to you dropping butthole pictures unsolicited to a group of people that would rather not see it. After that, I just decided to walk away from Cindy. I'm still in touch with Michelle to this day. She is doing better and we are glad we haven't bumped into Cindy ever again. That sounds like a nightmare player that has a lot of pent-up sexual frustration that does not know how to maturely handle it and does it in a very perverted and a salty-ish kind of way. You know, it's just, I see a lot of problems in the future for this person if they don't change and they're just gonna blame that society doesn't, ex I don't know, if, if, if there was ever a time in society, then now is the time to not feel, <laughs> you know, as, I don't know. Anyway, it's, I'm just so, I'm so utterly confused how people could be that oblivious and so sexually perverted in the open, you know? It's just, I don't know. Well, at least you got away from that person. Either way, they're out of your lives and hopefully your friend can recover from the trauma. 
Our next tale is called Player Demands Meta Knowledge and Accuses Me of Kidnapping. This happened quite a few years ago at a vampire, the Masquerade Lab. The setting was Sabbat. Myself and three friends were playing Inquisitors, essentially the hunters of the profane and those that make packs with infernal entities. A brand new player that had ingratiated herself into the local LARP circle and voiced interest in playing, so we encouraged her to make a character and join our pack. We'll call her Kathy. Without writing a small novella for background, this player was uh, unique. She had a habit of describing her combat actions in such intricate detail that the description of how she attacked the enemy one time around would often take in excess of two minutes. Oh, yikes. Before she knew if her attack had succeeded or not, oh, that's even worse, she was also a massive mooch. In several months of playing with her, taking road trips to neighboring games every other week, she never once paid for her own food. Her funds were wrapped up in her bank overseas, you see. She had just returned from teaching abroad for a semester and had neglected to renew her work visa while there and so had returned to the U.S. after less than a year. I later found out that the work visa forms had given her severe anxiety, so she had simply opted not to fill them out, because she was sure that they would make an exception for her and certainly wouldn't kick her out of the country for not filling out paperwork. A naive person. Myself and my friends gave her a thorough rundown of the system and the pack power structure. She made her character and we were ready to roll. Prior to leaving on this trip, she had asked that she be allowed to drive. Her grandmother had just bought her a vehicle, her first, and she had just gotten her license and she was excited to take it on a road trip. It was a three hour drive to this game and the rest of us had been driving there for nearly six months, so we were happy to let someone else take a turn behind the wheel. Of course, we covered her gas and her meals during stops because her funds were still tied up by international banking regulations. Immediately upon arriving at game, we were introduced to a scene where it became evident that one of the local players had formed an infernal pact. Directly into the deep end, our newest player and pack member went. We investigated, confirmed the information, and confronted the infernalist character. Immediately, Kathy took charge. And by take charge, I mean she halted the dialogue taking place, turned to me, the pack priest, and informed me that I was no longer needed, and she would be handling this moving forward. How delightful. While I was thrilled to see her taking a more active approach in her roleplay, we had previously informed her of the pack power structure. As a newly embraced vampire, she had very little authority in the Sabbat society. As the pack priest and a fully-fledged inquisitor, my character undeniably had more. I politely informed her that I would not be leaving, that this interrogation was my purview, and that she ha could stand silently for the remainder of the interrogation or leave. A bit harsh, I admit, but definitely in character for an elder vampire that had just been insulted and had their authority damaged by a child. Fair enough. In a half, Kathy left the room. Combat ensued, we eventually won the combat. At that point, we exited into the hallway, where Kathy was in hysterical tears being comforted by several players and members of the ST staff. We arrived in time to hear her say that I had basically kidnapped her and forced her to drive us over three hours against her will just to remove her from the scene and place her in timeout in the hallway like a child. Oh, she's one of those, I guess. She saw me and immediately informed me that moving forward I would be required to tell her what my character is thinking, his motivations, and all information pertaining to his actions at all times so, and I quote, I know you don't hate me, so I don't have an anxiety attack. She stated that this was only fair. I responded that I would be happy to roleplay with her in character and she was welcome to ask me those questions directly, and I may or may not respond honestly because vampire is a game of political intrigue and lying is the name of the game. She demanded a position of authority within the pact, and that she be made full inquisitor immediately as recompense for forcing her to drive us across the state and then making her sit outside in the hallway for two hours. It had been 20 minutes. By comparison, myself and the other inquisitors had been playing weekly for over a year to achieve our positions. We de-escalated the situation, but it was a very long, awkward car ride home. Shortly thereafter, Kathy left the pact to join the pact of a not-so-secret infernalist who offered her a position in the Inquisition if she would teach him her clan's unique discipline, and that ended about as well as you might think. Well, at least you got rid of this psychopath, honestly. I mean, I think it's better that she's just gone. Sounds like one of those people that's never wrong, always needs to be right, and has an excuse for everything, and 
has no responsibility or accountability or anything of the sort and just what a nightmare of a person. So good for you for letting them go. Sounds like your life would be much better without them. You know, maybe they'll find someone that they are compatible with and they could enjoy their time with because obviously that won't be you or your group. <laughs> this one is called, But I Thought You Were a Furry Too! How My Character Avoided a PC's Advances with the Only Way a Rogue Can Do It. Oh, another furry tale. Let's jump right in. This happened not long before the COVID-19 lockdown. I am a forever DM, but since I didn't have a party at the time, I decided to try to be a player. Last time I was a player, something happened that urged me to become a DM. But time had passed, and I decided this was a good time to be a player again. That is another story. Today I will tell you about that one time a player tried to make a stealth mission into another kind of mission. Trigger warning. There is an in-game attempt of assault. We have been warned. I applied to a campaign. It was the first time I would play online. The campaign was a homebrew world using the 5th edition system. The only thing that I was imposed on was that I needed to choose between being a cleric or a rogue since the party was short on those classes. I was happy to choose rogue and so my rogue tiefling was born. Her name is Kiva. She is a tiefling rogue that used to be part of a gang until she was used as a scapegoat to cover for another member and was beaten to her presumed death. This left her badly wounded to the point that her wings needed a considerable time to heal. I wanted her to have wings, but knowing it can be overpowered, we agreed that her wings would be healed at higher levels. The thing is, she couldn't recall exactly why this happened to her and that the DM could come up with something as a surprise. She was healed back and now worked with another player's character as assistance to an NPC that the party would meet. But I wanted my tiefling to look more bat-like, to apply some flavor so her face resembles somewhat of a human bat face, but not scary, so people wouldn't get frightened. I drew her and pitched her to the DM, and she agreed. This is important to the story. So the day of the session arrives. The party consists of another five players. Names have been changed. Dave, a human barbarian, Lizzie, a high elf wizard, Josh, a gnome fighter, Matt, a drow cleric of Elistre, and finally Nick, the problem player, a monk fox, red-skinned tabaxi. Dave, Lizzie, Matt, and Nick are in a cell, imprisoned for being suspects of a current incident. They make their introductions and then they are released but told not to leave the city because the culprits haven't been apprehended yet. They are intercepted by a private investigator who is working to solve the case but need more people to succeed. And so when he escorts them to his residence, where me and Josh are waiting, the detective introduces us as their assistants and new colleagues. I was making my introduction, describing Kiva, and I noticed that Nick seemed very enthusiastic when I mentioned her bat traits. The others introduce themselves to Josh's character and mine, and we begin to officially work as a party. During the session, Nick's character was always close to Kiva and was very friendly towards her. Kiva is in fact not much of a social character, so she remained civil towards his character and the others, save for Josh's character. This was because they knew each other for quite some time before the rest of the party arrived. After the first session, Nick started to message me. He talked about his character and how good and interested it was and so on. I told him that I was making a sketch of my character and he asked me to show it to him. He said that she was very attractive and was happy that I was in the game. I didn't think much of it at first, but then I would find out why he was so enthusiastic about my character. Session 2 arrives and Nick's character tries to be around Kiva as much as possible. He would offer her to buy her beer at the tavern or keep her company when she had to go buy something and find information. Anything you name, the fox was virtually glued to Kiva for whatever reason. Whenever I told him that my character could go alone, he would reply, We are a team. We need to help each other. Something could happen and you might need someone to save you. Yeah, like I'm going to need reinforcements to buy a health potion in the store next door. But, well, he tried to make my character talk more about herself or her past, and the thing is, Kiva is a bit distrustful, and this type of character that wouldn't even talk about how her breakfast was with someone who was still just an acquaintance to her. He would try to ask her more questions, and she would answer him with plain, yeah, nope, sure. 
To put it shortly, her personality was a lot like Hellboy, just more quiet. I wanted her to slowly warm up to the party as time passed, and Nick was relentlessly making me more and more annoyed. He also seemed annoyed that my character was closer to Josh's. At one point, his character tells Mayan that he finds her cute and that they should get to know each other better. But Kiva, being herself, told him that she was flattered, but she didn't feel the same. Especially since in-game, these characters had only known each other for just about a few days. We end the session after a battle, after which he messaged me asking me why Kiva hasn't opened up more to his character. That he has been nothing but nice to her, and she was acting cold and distant. I told him that my character needed time to warm up to others before fully trusting them. He told me that she should trust him, be more friendly, and that her behavior was unjustified, and that if I made it so, they could get along just fine. I told him that Kiva is my character and that he should only worry about playing his. Nice way to set boundaries, by the way. Kudos to you. Good job, Kiva. Session 3 arrives. We get a new mission, and it ends in a battle. At the very end of this session, we found out that an important NPC in the campaign was in cahoots with the current antagonists of the campaign. It was mentioned that this lead might help us stop the web of corruption in the city. We needed proof of the NPC's involvement, however, so we agreed on a stealth mission, and Kiva being a rogue was an obvious choice. Nick, I, I offer to go with her, he says. Matt, I can help. I can make someone invisible, so no, we can do it ourselves. Plus, you might need a spell slot. I guess, but... I respond, wait, no, it's just going to be an in and out mission. And with invisibility, I think I can make it. I just need someone else to alert me if someone is coming or to create a distraction. Lizzie, it's the house of a notorious NPC. We are going to need everyone just to be safe. No, me and OP can do this alone. You can wait for us here. <laughs> no way, man. If you two go alone, you might get killed. Nick kept arguing that we could get this done alone. But everyone and me knew that a plan like that was stupid. We agreed on the following. Me and Nick would go into the house while some would distract the NPC at a ball he was attending at the moment and the others would keep watch and alert us if anything happens. I really didn't want Nick accompanying me, but I just told myself that it wasn't going to be that bad. This was a stealth mission after all. What could possibly happen? Warning. Here is where things turn south. Mentions of attempted assault. Session 4 arrives and the plan is set in motion. I'll spare you the details and go to the important part. A few very lucky rolls and we got the papers that proved the NPC's involvement. We had a fight with some animated objects that acted like some sort of security system, but we did it. The dice were on our side. We only needed to get out unnoticed to successfully finish the mission. Now we are finally out of the NPC's residency and in his garden. Freedom is at hand. We get to a wall that has bushes and some trees. The Nick pushes his luck and pulls this. I was about to roll when he asked, Are we hidden enough? The DM replies, Yes, the bushes and trees cover you just enough, I guess. Good, he said. I pin Kiva to the wall. And rolls for it. He succeeds. Wait, what? I exclaim. Dude, we're about to escape. What are you doing? Nick says, I think we can celebrate our success now. And he describes how he tries to grab my character's tail and turn her around. The DM and the rest of the players were dumbfounded. Lizzie told him to quit it and to get out. Dave and Matt couldn't believe what was happening, and Josh was asking if he could do something, but he wasn't close enough to do anything. The DM was still thinking what to say or do, and before she could say anything, I say, I, I tried to free myself. Nick tries to object, but the DM lets me. I am free now, and then I say, I, I cut off one of his fingers. There was a small pause, and she finally says, Okay, roll for it. Nick tried to make the DM stop, but I rolled and got a natural 19, rolled my D4 for damage, and it was done. I described how my character swiftly cuts off one of his fingers, show my dagger to his character's face and tells him, shove it up your ass, and make Kiva leave the scene. Good for you, that was amazing, yes, yes, I love it. Nick finally makes it out there, but not before the DM describes how some guards saw some movement in the garden and were coming there. 
Nick used the cloth to cover his hand so the blood doesn't make a trail, and using different paths to avoid suspicion, we finally make it. The two players that attended the ball finally came back, and the session ended sooner than usual. I blocked Nick after that. Good for you, screw that guy. Later, I messaged the DM and told her that I wasn't going to continue the campaign. She tried to convince me to stay, that she was sorry that happened, and that she would talk to Nick to stop behaving like a creep. Uh, no, 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 no. You should have stayed playing, but everyone should have kicked Nick, 100%. I mean, of course, unless you wanted to stop playing, then obviously, but I mean, Nick should be gone without question. You don't, you just don't do stuff like that. But at this point, I wasn't going to comply. I tell her to tell the others that my character decided to leave in the middle of the night and fix her memory somewhere else with the permission of her employer. She tried to convince me again. I asked her if Nick was going to be there. She said yes, that they were longtime friends and it was hard for her and other two players to just shoot him from the party. I guess you had no choice but to leave then. So I say thanks but no. She then told me that Nick was confused because he thought that I might be a furry because of my character, that others... I don't know who exactly suspected that too, and she confirmed that Nick is in fact one. No, for the record, I am not a furry. I told her no again. She told me she understood it, apologized to me one last time, and I left. Even if you were a furry, that doesn't excuse Nick's actions. At all. Period. I felt a bit guilty. Maybe I could have handled it better than what I did to his character. Like, just leave the game right after that moment. Truth is, I am nothing like my character. I don't like conflict. I played her the way I thought she would react. I just wanted out. After that, I told myself I wasn't going to play female characters again, or anything that looked not even 1% close to an animal. Since then, I have come back to the seat of DM. I'll end this with something that a friend of mine told me after I narrated this story to her. As I finished the story and how I wasn't comfortable playing female characters again or with animal traits, she tells me this. Being a female character of any kind wasn't the problem. He was. Go play female characters if you want. Don't play victim. Next time someone tries to do that to any of your characters, make sure to cut more than just the one finger. Maybe that last thing she said was a bit much. I don't think so. But if something like this happens to you, don't be afraid to speak out. Either pause the session, talk to the DM, or anything. Just don't let this keep you from playing the characters you want. Also, I do know not all furries are like that, but this didn't give the best impression. Edit. Thank you everyone for your support. I wasn't sure to post it at first, but now I'm glad I did. I feel more encouraged to share more stories. You are right. I should have cut the whole hand. And to clarify, I don't hold it against the furry community. In the end, what made me leave for good was not only the actions of the problem player, but knowing that despite what he did, he was going to continue in the campaign. And to find out that just because the problem player thought we have the one thing in common that meant that we would be more personal with each other, it doesn't excuse him, of course. It's like believing as someone is a Star Wars fan, and somehow that means that you should force them to be with you one way or another. Being a jerk is not exclusive to one group. There are jerks in every group. If you need to know, my friend told me to play whatever I wanted about a month after the incident. So I am hoping to play either Kiva again or another character soon, since now I have an active group and one of the players has expressed an interest in DMing. Thank you again. Good for you. You shouldn't have to put up with that. And obviously, if something like that happens, yes, you should get rid of that player. And if they're all friends, then I guess obviously you can have a discussion, but you weren't close to Nick. So you feeling uncomfortable and leaving, you shouldn't feel guilty at all. In fact, yes, you should have cut off his nuts. That would have been more appropriate than a finger. But hey, you seem like a nice person. However, that's no excuse for what they did. You should not feel guilty, you did nothing wrong. You acted in game, you acted responsibly, you talked after the fact and you made it very clear. You set boundaries. Honestly, I think you handled everything perfectly. There's nothing you could have done better. So good for you for taking a stand and being strong and moving forward with what was right. And shame on the rest of them for allowing Nick to be such a piece of shit. This one is called, Disgusting DM runs one creepy mini session that destroys two underage players' views of D&D. Yikes, this sounds terrible. Before we get started, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, because it helps immensely. And if you have already, you're amazing. All right, let's, let's get into it. Caution, sexual reference, mild violence, mild swearing, general creepiness. If it was a movie, I'd rate it an M, if that helps. You mean a game. Are movies rated M? I, what? Okay, anyways. The DM of my nightmares, okay? 
So to start off with names changed for privacy, there was me, a 16-year-old female with autism, which I partially blame for my poor handling of the situation to come. B, 16-year-old female, my best friend. Cricket, 12-year-old female, Mantis, kid's sister. Mantis, 18-year-old male, Cricket's older brother, whose birthday party we were at. Bunyan, early mid-twenties male, family friend of Mantis, creepy DM. This is a recipe for disaster. Okay. B and I attended Mantis' birthday together as I was allowed to invite her. We had a bit of fun, but were mostly very awkward as we knew no one else there besides Mantis and his sister Cricket. Eventually, we ended up sitting inside with Cricket. There were a couple older guys in there chatting, but everyone else was outside. Me and B were considering leaving early, but Cricket argued she would be lonely, so we agreed to stay longer and talk to her. Somehow, we got onto the topic of D&D, which none of us had played before, but Cricket and I were extremely eager to play one day. B didn't know anything about D&D, so I started excitedly explaining what I knew, which wasn't very much. Then, out of nowhere, Bunyan, whom we hadn't spoken a word to yet, was apparently listening in on our entire conversation, interrupted us. He got up and sat next to me, which made me awkward, a bit uncomfortable, and told us that he was a DM and he could run us a mini session right then to help us learn about the game. Well, being that you're at a party, a birthday party, there's going to be a mixture of all ages and I guess it's not weird to try and do it. So let's see where this goes. It's probably going to get terrible, but okay, at least the setting at least makes sense why someone of that age would be DMing for as long as young as a 12 year old. Okay. Honestly, I had been waiting years to play and felt like I was extremely excited at the idea. B was unsure she wasn't that interested in D&D, but agreed because Cricket and I were so excited. Cricket hurriedly searched for Mantis D&D stuff and I asked Bunyan if we could invite the others outside to play. He wanted to ask alone, so he went out and came back after like 30 seconds and said he had asked everyone and no one wanted to play, but it was okay because he preferred to just play with us girls so as not to get overwhelmed. I mean, you don't want a huge D&D party, I guess, especially in like this random one shot, so maybe that's not so weird. The, the I don't, okay, we'll, we'll, it, oh, it's going to get terrible, I can just, I know, because it's here in this subreddit, but, ah, oh, okay, okay, right, but leading up to it, just, whatever, but don't lie about it, just say, I don't want to invite more people, because I don't want to camp, like, run a random campaign with, like, 11 players, that would be horrendous, okay. We sat around the dining table with some blank paper and Bunyan helped us make our characters. He wouldn't let us look at the book to see the basic rules and such as there wasn't enough time, which we suppose made sense so we had no issues. I made up a 16 year old elf wizard and when I was nervous about how spells and stuff work, Bunyan said he would just tell me what spells I can use and when. B made a 16 year old human cleric and Cricket made an 18 year old tabaxi rogue. She was excited to be the oldest. All of the characters had no stats because we had no idea we were supposed to have them and Bunyan didn't tell us. He also seemed to really focus on the physical description of my character, which I thought was strange. Yes, this is awkward. We wrote our character names on our paper and then Bunyan started explaining the story. B and Cricket were in a tavern as a team looking for a quest. They roleplayed a while, asking NPCs about jobs and stuff. Eventually, I asked where I was and I wanted to join them. A smirk came across Bunyan's face and he described me waking up naked in the middle of a field. Okay, this is not appropriate! Why? I was immediately uncomfortable, as you should be, but when I asked why, he said I didn't know why, as I had woken up with amnesia. Not appropriate, man! Cricket was giggling awkwardly at the taboo subject and B was looking concerned. I was dumbfounded and I kind of just sat there. This is when you call one of the parents from outside to come in here and just completely obliterate this DM! Ugh. Ugh. B asked if her character could go to where mine was to help, but Slug said no. Our characters had never met before, they didn't even know where I am, so it would be almost impossible to find it. 
they give up and decide to leave the town on their quest and hope that maybe they will come across my character accidentally. I asked Bunyan if I could maybe use magic to make clothes for myself. Nope, I had no magic. I asked if I could try to climb the mountains. Nope, I was elderly and very weak. Huh? I asked if there were any ways through the mountains. Nope, I was completely stuck. I was getting very upset at this point, as every question I asked made it worse, and I was basically no longer playing the character I had chosen. Bunyan assured me I might be able to turn back later. The girls were traveling through some woods and discussing their plans and how they were going to find the magical object they needed for their quest without a map. Meanwhile, Bunyan seems pleased. The more flustered and desperate for a way out I get, and eventually he just straight up six a massive group of giant bat-like creatures upon me, the powerless human hag. I am brought very close to death, although no rolls are made at any point. I am beginning to shut down mentally as a sort of defense mechanism, as I am overwhelmed. To his credit, Bunyan does appear to notice this, and he describes how I suddenly find a cave in the side of the mountain, even though there was none when I had asked earlier. And I dragged my bloody body inside as I could not walk any longer. Cricket and Bee seemed to think hard and whispered among themselves, possibly making a plan. They asked if they could leave the woods. Bunyan agreed, and they did. Then they asked if they could see any mountains, even far off in the distance. Bunyan immediately picked up on the slight metagaming and told them their characters wouldn't have any reason to be looking for mountains. They seemed disappointed as they gave up on their plan, returning to the woods. I tried begging him to just let me have clothes or give me my race, age, or magic back. He seemed to enjoy my begging immensely as he kind of just smiled in a really gross way and stared at me as I pleaded. Oh my goodness, what a creep. Eventually, after an uncomfortable amount of time, he said, You're cute. Okay, you can be a 16-year-old elf again, but you're still weak and powerless and you do not have any way to make clothes. I felt like there were bugs crawling down my spine when he said that and even Cricket had stopped laughing. All of us were uncomfortable and I felt sick. There was something about the way he spoke to me, the tone of his voice, and the look on his face that just made my stomach turn. Oh, and he also informed me that the cave I had crawled into was a cave full of those bat monsters. I asked if I, please, could just quietly leave the cave without disrupting the bats, and he said, Okay, only because you asked so nicely. He then explained that there was a second opening in the cave, and that I carefully crawled out of it and slid down a stream of magical water, which is what turned me back into my 16-year-old elf, and I was now on the outside of the ring of mountains. One of the bats from the cave had seen and followed me, but was not attacking. The girls were trekking along, bonding, and generally having a much easier time than me. I didn't understand why my character had to be different. I didn't like it. All I wanted was to go on an adventure with my friends. When it was my turn again, I asked if I could avoid the bat thingy, but Bunyan said that it was struck by my character's sudden transformation from an ugly hag into a beautiful young woman, and had decided to accompany me as a companion that I could ride. Okay, a little weird and unexpected, but I wasn't going to turn down an opportunity to fly towards the nearest town. I rode the bats, and apparently the town girls weren't actually that far away, and I reached them almost instantly. They cared for me, giving me some food, water, and dressing my wounds. We were so happy to all be together now. Little did we know, it would only get worse from here. Oh my goodness. How could it get worse? The thing is, he really did not want my character to find or make clothes. Now keep in mind, this character was basically me, a 16-year-old girl who was very uncomfortable. B offered her cloak and Bunyan reluctantly accepted, though he tried to argue that they needed their clothes and it was risky to give them to me because apparently it was now deep winter and freezing outside so they might freeze without their extra layers. I don't know, none of it made sense to me. They said it was worth it and shared their clothes, which apparently didn't fit me very well, even though me and B are very close in size. Basically, I showed a lot of cleavage. <sighs> And also, I couldn't have any pants because the girls couldn't just take their pants off for me, obviously. This is so disturbing. 
When we asked if we could all walk back to town to buy more clothes, he refused, stating we didn't have any money anyway, even though Cricket had used money earlier to buy a drink before they left town. We relented because I think none of us were confident enough to just end the game there, but I secretly texted my mom to pick us up early under the table. Good for you. As you should have. Then the worst thing happened. The ruiner of all hope. The epitome of get the frick out. A traveling merchant, the most disturbing NPC, appeared. Now this merchant had some things we really needed. Pants, a map, and a magical object that may restore my power. The merchant was described as being elderly and male. The merchant discovered our aforementioned lack of money and offered us a deal. He said if one of us girls would sell our bodies to him, oh my goodness. Now! Then he would give us a bunch of gold, which we could then use to buy items and have extra for later. This is where you should have screamed, had somebody come in, explain the situation, had this guy Obliterated and arrested, called the cops, got him out, just, just like removed him from society, thrown him into a jail cell, and forgot about him. But that probably didn't happen, did it? Oh my goodness, okay. It seemed ridiculous, and I think we all sort of thought it was a joke. So we just refused at first, and I mentioned, reminded, sorry, and I reminded Bunyan that Cricket was only 12. He said it was fine because the merchant doesn't want her anyway. That's not fine! Then the merchant asked my 16-year-old elf if she was a virgin. Okay. I was horrified and refused to answer. So then out of character, he asked me quietly if I was a virgin in real life. What a freaking creep. I said nothing, frozen in shock and horror. But he seemed to think he could just tell because he declared something along the lines of... You're definitely pure, I can tell, because you're shy. Okay, so the merchant uses magic to see that you are unspoiled and declares generously that he will pay triple. I am so sorry that you went through this. This is not okay. This person has problems and should be reported to the authorities because obviously this person is a freaking creep. I'm terribly sorry that you experienced this as a young woman. This is not okay. B argued, saying this was ridiculous and we didn't need anything from the merchant, and Cricket asked if she could attempt to just rob or murder the merchant because he was clearly a villain. Bunyan did not appreciate this and said the merchant was a magic user, so we could not kill him, and that if we didn't get the special items from him, then we wouldn't be able to continue our adventure or whatever. I did not care about playing anymore, and when I finally registered that he would not back down, I panicked and said, we should pack up because my mom was almost there. Bunyan said we could still play till she came, as there really wasn't much to pack up, but I insisted on ending the game. Good for you. The problem was that Cricket didn't really want to stop, as she was having fun before the merchant, and even though she understood the merchant was bad and that's why she wanted to kill him, she didn't really seem to understand that he wasn't just a villain. This meant that while we were starting to pack up, Cricket was trying to come up with a plan to get the stuff off the merchant so we could still play. Eventually, she said that maybe she could give the merchant a kiss if he would give us the stuff. I said it wasn't happening. Cricket seemed genuinely sad. The innocence and this Bunyan freak taking advantage is so disturbing. I felt guilty for ruining her fun. You shouldn't feel guilty. This guy is a freaking pervert and doesn't deserve any of your time. He deserves a lot worse. So I gave in and, oh no, and said I would flirt with the merchant a bit and see if I could get him to give us the items without actually doing anything. I am so sorry you had to do this. Or felt that you had to do this. You did not have to do this. Oh my goodness. I said I flirt with the merchant and Bunny asked, what do you say and do? I was incredibly nauseous by this point and I said I don't know. He said I would have to try harder than that. I felt a buzz in my pocket so I looked at my phone. A text from mom said she was almost here. I looked at Bunny and said, I lean in really close with my hand on his back and I whisper in his ear that he is disgusting. 
Then I slam my knee into his balls and leave. Good for you. Good for you. He was shocked and honestly, so was I. Come on, B. Mom's here to pick us up. I was not feeling confident in that moment. I said the coolest thing I could think of at the time, but it didn't make me feel any better. Obviously, you're going to be traumatized from that experience, but that's that was the proper thing to say to that freaking weirdo. I grabbed my bag as Cricket was laughing hysterically, and B and I said goodbye to Mantis and Cricket before heading out to Mom's car, where we proceeded to tell her the story as we drove home. She was pissed, but I didn't know the guy's real name, so there wasn't much to do about it. Oh, yes, there was. Mom could have driven back, told everyone there. What do you mean there's nothing you could have done about it? Are you kidding me? You tell her that and she just is okay with it? I mean, being pissed and then not doing anything is... What? To my horror, later that night, when I was unpacking my bag, I realized Bunyan had written his socials down on my player sheet so I would contact him. I threw it away and ended up moving states for my mom's job, so I never went to another party at Mantis and subsequently never had to see Bunyan again. Oh, you should have reported this guy. B, Mantis, and I are still very close, and I asked about Cricket every now and then. She is doing well. What's an odd ending? Your mom could have gone back. She could have called somebody. Talked about the guy there. You had the socials you could have reported. Why Why did you let it go? That's not okay. Someone like that should not be let off the hook. Oh, okay. Sadly, though, after this experience, I pretty much renounced D&D, and so did B. One day, four years later, I was invited to play in a group of disabled youths, and after much consideration, I joined. They needed more members, and I have had so much fun playing with a lovely group of, of people my own age, I am even planning to DM for the first time soon. I realize now that what happened that day was not D&D, rather it was just an adult man trying to manipulate a 16-year-old into some kind of improv pornographic scene or something in front of another 16-year-old and a 12-year-old little girl. I'm so angry I didn't stop the game sooner at the time as I don't think it was a very healthy experience for Cricket and I was older and should have been looking out for her. But I was too busy being overwhelmed and sick to my stomach to see outside my own head. I am also really sad I missed out on so many years I could have been playing this wonderful magical game that actually makes me feel like I have a place in the world. Sadly, B has never played any RPG since. She's more stubborn, and once she decides she doesn't like something, changing her mind is like trying to chew through a diamond. Basically, Bunyan did bad. I did bad. We had an awful time, and I almost stopped playing D&D forever after my first ever session, which wasn't really D&D in the first place, and my best friend will never play an RP game again. Edit. I showed this post to my mom, and she is handling things. Sadly, even now, as an adult, I struggle intensely with any level of confrontation. I'm incredibly grateful for all of the support I have received in the comments. The D&D community truly is wonderful despite its flaws, and I am glad I decided to return and be a part of it. Thank you so much for your kindness and advice. I am so sorry that you went through that and that everyone there had to experience that. It's unfortunate that that guy was just let go, but... You just handled it how you handled it, and I don't know, it's just, I hope stuff like that doesn't happen in the world, but unfortunately it does, so when it does happen, I feel like those people need to be taken care of, and just report them to the authorities, to their family, just try and get them out of society, because those people don't belong, because they're just, they can't function in a society where things like that are just completely unacceptable. Anyways, good for you for continuing on after that. I'm glad you found something you find joy in and purpose. But uh, I hope things like that don't go left unpunished. This one is called The Tale of Hank the Horrible. What's a name? Content warning. Mentions of sexual assault and necrophilia? Question mark. Sounds disturbing, just the place where it belongs. Every now and then I decide to run a multi-part mini campaign I like to call The Balance Lost. 
The basic premise is that entities called the Lost Gods decide to destroy the cosmic balance between good, evil, law, and chaos, and use them as chess pieces in a massive four-player game, which leads to an all-out war across the multiverse. Not the WOTC kind of multiverse. I mean the multiverse before 5th edition. Because, you know, it's competently written. All players are higher level characters because the multiverse needs levels 20s to save them, not level 1s. Cough, cough, take notes, Wizards of the Coast. Cough, cough. And in case anyone is wondering, yes, this was inspired by the comic book Elric Balance Lost. Anyway, I get a group together and the cast is as follows. Me, the DM, yours truly, O'Reilly, an artificer from a world destroyed by the forces of law. Her weapon is a gun that eats souls. Hera, a centaur cleric from a world that is being invaded by the demon lord Pazuzu. Her weapon is a bow that can banish demons. Tom Tom, a wizard from the world of Mistara, where good and evil are already dead, and now law and chaos are tearing each other a new one. His weapon is a bongo that can deafen monsters. Gerald, a dwarven barbarian from a world where chaos has turned everything into primordial soup. His weapon is the axe of the dwarvish lords. Eric, a guy who lives in New Jersey and is a human fighter. Yes, really. His weapon is a sword called a Trollbane, which stops healing of any kind for up to a day. Hank, our problem player, your standard human storm barbarian from the forgettable realms, where chaos and evil have teamed up to beat up law and good. His weapon, choice, is a buffed up berserker axe. Sounds like a lot of people for this campaign. Very cool. I run an individual session zero for each player, where their worlds begin descending into either a chaotic mess or stagnation from the power of law. At the end, I roll a D100 to see which world the party ends up first. I get New Jersey. Next session, everyone finds themselves in a New Jersey where the forces of law are turning everything into crystals. Hank realizes that the place is New Jersey and seems annoyed. Hank, why the hell are we in New Jersey? Me, because our world while existing outside of the multiverse can still collide with worlds from the multiverse. I thought I explained how this works at character creation. Uh, whatever. It's just dumb as all. I'm a little offended, but continue regardless. The party takes down a tank with the arrow of law painted on it, and suddenly a horde of chaotic rioters starts burning down stuff as chaos finds its way into the world too. Good and evil soon follow, and the party must flee, entering the back room of a coffee shop, which leads to the party's shock to the city of doors. Sigil with a hard G. Deal with it. Everyone's amazed by the sights and scenes, but Hank is uh, unimpressed. He even said so in chat, but I just ignored him. Anyway, soon enough, the Endless Spire, which Sigil is located on top of, comes under attack by the armies of all alignments, and the factions in the city have to make a tough call to defend their extraplanar home or to turn on the city. Nah, it's not even a choice. They attack each other without question. In the chaos, one small coffee shop seems unaffected, and the party enters, only to find a tiefling looking outside melancholically. The tiefling, my old Planescape PC, introduces himself as Salus Woe, and as I describe him, Hank interrupts me. Wait, why does he look so human? Why has he crazy colors, and where is his tail and horns? Um, I prefer to do tieflings the way they were presented in 2nd edition Planescape. But they haven't looked like that since. O'Reilly. Hank, not important right now. Everyone else. Yeah, man, focus, would you? Ugh, whatever, this is dumb. He still sticks around, and after the session, I tell him that he's on some thin ice. He agrees to cool down the criticism, and I thank him. This was a huge mistake. The party sets out the next day with Salus and some fellow adventurers, fighting their way through a small horde of mercy killers and hard heads, before reaching the Lady of Pain. But she does not speak with words, she speaks with uh, images. The party spends a while deciphering her words until they figure out the clue. Where the old ones slumber lies the cosmic balance. Tom Tom decides to seek out a Mysterian cleric 
of any kind. O'Reilly and Eric set out to find a library, and Hank and Gerald bond over massacring some law fanatics. Goody two-shoes, evildoers, and chaos nuts. Tom Tom gets the attention of the immortal Ixion, immortals being similar to gods, but also different in many ways, like not dying when their worshippers are lost, and having all their powers the second they shed their immortal coil. But they're also somewhat weaker than gods who tells him that the Old Ones are the creators of Mistara, and their location is lost, even to him. Then Mistara is consumed by a strange energy that seems to obliterate the world and its inhabitants. After the session, Hank tells me that it was annoying having to decipher my crappy drawings, but I retort by saying that that's how an entire race of Planescape communicates. I just thought it'd be a neat puzzle encounter. He pipes down again for now. After another session of seeking out the way of the location of the old ones, the party makes it to a world where countless amorphous entities are fast asleep, these being the old ones, and are shocked to see the massive forms of the lost gods by a destroyed scale, the cosmic balance itself, which was destroyed by the lost gods, who now also notice the party. They aren't hostile, just annoyed, because one of them, Quill, I know, real original, was winning before Hank and O'Reilly swapped sides. The party argues that the balance must be kept and life is sacred, which the Lost Gods don't care for, because life is secondary to deciding who can win their dispute. However, another god, Frock, suggests taking on a more active role in their little game, so they summon the forces of law, good, chaos, and evil, acting as their commanders in a massive field battle. The party are shocked by this and start figuring out how to buy more time before one of these sides wins, so their solution is to use a powerful artifact they got from the Lady of Pain before their departure to summon all adventurers from all worlds. Yes, even Mistara just before the energy killed everyone and everything. Hera explains that no matter what, none of the four alignment axes can win this battle and they're all for now enemies. The adventurers, including many of my old characters, my friends' characters, and canon characters like Morden Kanan, who speaks like Gary Gijax, and Elminster, who is an old perv, charge into battle to preserve the balance. The party eventually figures out that they can use their artifacts to create an impromptu scale that begins repairing the balance, but another lost god, Hrul, stomps it out before any significant repairs can be done. Everyone starts fighting off the forces of the alignment spectrum while O'Reilly and Eric start fixing up the impromptu scale again. Then Hank proclaims, I attack Eric. What? Everyone. What? I'm sick of this crap. I'll just kill them and let the alignments destroy each other, thus creating the perfect multiverse. Well, I did say PvP is okay with consent, so sure, O'Reilly. I'm gonna fight him too. I care too much about the multiverse to let one of its heroes die. So a three-way PvP ensues, which costs O'Reilly's soul. Hank had some good crit luck, and he did not let her roll any death saves. He went all in, even shooting her with her own soul-eating gun. But Eric takes Hank down with Troll Bane and starts reassembling the scale. Hera sees Hank wounded, but realizes she's been taken down with Troll Bane, which means even if she wanted to, she didn't. She could not heal him up despite his pleas. I roll all death saves in secret, and regrettably, Hank survives. Eric realizes that he can maybe call for all the gods and higher beings of the multiverse to aid in the repair process of the balance. This wakes up the old ones, who ignore the battle going on in their front lawn, and instead fix the scale with their power, and the power of countless still-living gods who value balance. The damages to all worlds come undone, all universes that collapsed or merged are mended, and the balance is restored, which causes the force of law and chaos, good and evil alike, to attack one another until the annoyed old ones send them home before continuing their millennia-long slumber. Hank comes to after the hour in a field littered with corpses of angels, demons, archons, and mortals alike. Elminster suffered a heart attack so massive that his soul vanished, so no rest for him. Oops, no grudges here, I swear. And he was being eaten by my half-elf, half-ogre barbarian, Haruka, who was pissed, and attacked the party. But I told him, no, not anymore. The adventure is over. He was not having it. Screw you! I'm not gonna let this go unanswered. Dude, you lost fair and square, and your wounds couldn't have been healed anyway. Screw that! I'm killing everyone in the party! And I'm gonna assault their corpses and whack off in VC so you can all... I bring down the band gun. 
Everyone blocks Hank after he sends them graphic messages of how he will bang their cold dead corpses and draw art of it. Everyone else thanks me for a fun game and we keep the server going for a week longer so we can talk some highlights and memories. Overall, a pretty good game of The Balance Lost. What's a long story? That ending justified the post, honestly. Everything leading up to that, I was like, okay, it sounds kind of like an annoying player trying to meta game, maybe. Maybe you're mixing up different editions and they have different expectations and they're communicating it in a way that's just annoying and they're kind of like backseating. I get it. It's That didn't really justify much of a whole story. It just seems kind of like it happens. You know, it's not that big of a deal, I don't think. It, it can be annoying. I don't know if it's grounds for getting rid of a player. It could be. It depends on how, how far it goes and how annoying it is for everyone. If, if nobody's enjoying the game, then obviously, you know, get rid of them. But if it's only between, like, the DM and a player and no one else seems to mind, then I guess it is what it is. But that last part, obviously, yes, of course, ban him instantly. Assaulting corpses and drawing art and just... How do you go from just a, a, just a very metagamey nuisance to an assaulty psychopath murderer guy that's just, it's such a weird jump really zero to 100 huh i guess it wasn't zero maybe it was about 40 maybe from 40 to 100 but either way good for you for getting rid of that guy because if he's willing to go that far and then message people about what a what a crazy person over a game yikes People really need to learn how to control their emotions, especially in a fantasy thing. It's supposed to be fun. Anyways, thank you for sharing. Much appreciated. Good thing you got rid of him, because that sounds like a crazy person. Well, this one is called, Grown Problem Player Calls Mom on Our Group and Things Get Weird. Oh, let's find out. CW, Weird Sexual Behavior and Real Life Incest. Oh, yikes. Yeah, it was bad. So this happened yesterday and the situation is kind of still unfolding so there may be edits with updates about what's going on. Also sorry for any spelling or grammar mistakes. I'll try to catch them but it's late at night and I cannot for the life of me find my glasses. No worries, we'll be patient. First, I must introduce the table. I go to XX College, and my whole group was gathered from people that either go to that same school or work and live nearby. Some of them I was friends with before the campaign. Others I've never met, but had some connection to someone else in the group. A friend of a friend sort of deal. And then there is one guy who, to this day, I don't know how he even heard we were playing D&D and joined. Because nobody at my table knew him. To give these people some fake names, we have GM, the GM, my roommate and best friend, Gyro, a chill guy playing a human warlock, Mouse, a super short player playing a goliath monk, Rango, a tall player playing an art artificer of an unknown race, also one of my best friends, and Ditz, most comfy human being of all time, playing a tiefling bard, Edgy, that guy, playing a half-elf rogue, and me, playing a human paladin. We have our cast. We decided to meet bi-weekly at Edgy's house, since he had all the space we needed to play, and an actual table to sit at. Despite the kind of person we'd later realize he'd become, he was a decent host and his only rules were to keep the area clean, which he himself regularly didn't do, and to not get too loud as to not disturb his mom, who lived with him. Or he lived with her. I don't actually know, as he's changed his story so many times. Anyway, the campaign was going great. It was set in a jungle where a bunch of wizards exploded and made everything all magical and sentient, to the point where a kingdom of killer banana bunches had set up rule in a nearby town. This will come into play later. GM was great too with a pretty amazing ability to come up with some of the best ideas I've ever heard on the fly. Seriously, he showed me his planning document once, and it was like a dozen bullet points that didn't even talk about the story. Everyone was having a lot of fun. We had all played before, so we were pretty comfortable with roleplay. Hearing Mouse put on a deep voice for her player was fantastic, and Gyro's goofy antics were great. But the characters I want to talk about are Rango and Ditz. You see, Rango formerly belonged to a group of bandits that worked in absolute secrecy, even between its members. Rango followed that tradition after they left, meaning they kept anything about their true identity hidden, going as far as 
them wearing a hat, trench coat, and chameleon-shaped mask at all times. It became a fun mystery, figuring out just who this laid-back medieval cowboy engineer really was. Notably, Rango's gender was also a secret and they went by they-them pronouns, and took care not to enter any gendered fixtures preferring to disappear into the woods to take a leak. I say this is notable because Edgy was constantly trying to find out what was in their pants. I mean sneaking up and trying to remove Rangel's mask in their sleep. Luckily, the player thought to put an alarm spell up. Trying to get them to have sex with someone else didn't work. Rangel always said that time spent having sex was time not being spent holding up a bank, and outright going on out-of-character tirades on why Rango should have a gender reveal specifically. This got a little weird, but we thought it wasn't too big of a deal and Rango's player didn't seem to care, so nobody really stopped him. Mistake, I know. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and all that. Ditz, on the other hand, was literally just Rango's IRL player as a character. You see, Rango's and Ditz's players are super close friends in real life. Rango's player is also pretty hypersexual, and she openly owns the fact that she's pretty easy as a person. Ditz's player, on the other hand, is a complete asexual and is a quiet and shy person in real life, which makes it even more hilarious that she roleplays as the horniest bard you've ever seen, and she once avoided an entire adventure just by sleeping with a string of people, all the way up to a queen, who was technically a suit of armor. Ditz's player also enjoyed making a voice and using mannerisms that sound just like Rango's player, who herself is uses a talks like Dritz player while in character. It's like they've switched personalities while playing D&D, and it's a really fun dynamic that everyone has a great time with. I just realized I've never described Edgy. Well, think of the most stereotypical rogue you could possibly imagine, but instead of being ironic and funny like Ditz, he's played completely straight and the player thinks they're the epitome of cool. That's it. That's all he is. Generic to the core, but oh well, it worked. Anyway, Edgy was constantly making advances on Ditz in game, which is a bit strange considering how Ditz was clearly based off a real person sitting at the table. But it wasn't anything too weird, and Rango's player said she was fine with it when asked. However, Edgy had to wait a while to get what he wanted despite her real life personality and preferences in roleplay. Ditz was a master flirt could charm just about anyone. This meant that, by two weeks ago, the session before yesterday's, she had amassed a harem that spanned across the continent and never have a night that she wasn't planning on sleeping with someone else. Fortunately for Edgy and unfortunately for everyone else, as this was the beginning of the madness, we had a night where it would just be our party camping out in the woods, giving Ditz and Edgy a perfect opportunity to do the deed, which they did in the standard fade to black style as always. Like I said, this is where the madness began. You see, Edgy's player liked to draw and was actually somewhat good at it. He had this anime sort of style, but everyone at the table enjoyed the medium, so we often used his art in the campaign. One practice he liked was that, at the end of each session, he would draw out an event that happened so that we could add it to our notes. I actually really liked this idea, and it was a fun use of his skills. But this time, he wanted to draw something a little bit different. Apparently, his standout event of the session was having sex with Ditz, and that's what he wanted to capture in his art. And of course, every good artist needs a reference, and Ditz was clearly based off a real person, even in looks. So it wouldn't be creepy at all to ask Rango's player for, say, pictures of herself doing various lewd acts, would it? Yeah, needless to say, Edgy's player was not just going to be using those pictures as drawing material, and Rango's player was not having it with his insistence on lying about his intentions. Rango's player immediately GM about this, and he warned the rest of us to be careful with Edgy's player, and that he would confront him about it during our next session. And so yesterday's session began. Despite the situation, everyone was in good spirits, and Rango's player made sure to arrive with GM so Edgy's player wouldn't try to talk to her first. GM then quickly pulled Edgy's player to another room. And there was some hushed talking while the rest of us got set up to play, thinking that he would just accept his actions were wrong, apologize, and move on. 
He did not. Instead, he speed walks out of the room, goes halfway up the stairs, and yells, Mom! And this is where the real story begins. Edgy's player's mom, I'm calling her Jocasta from now on, is a shortish woman that looks to be in her early 50s. And we've seen her around the house before, but she's never really introduced herself or interacted with us. There have been attempts on our end, but she mainly avoids our table like the plague. So it comes as a strange event that, at the behest of her grown son, she comes down and begins to worry over him, pulling him in to a tight hug. Edgy's player begins to almost tearfully describe the situation. Of course, he made it seem like he did absolutely nothing wrong and that Rango's player was just a mean girl rejecting him and GM was just a big bully. As Joe Costa continues to wrap her arms around his shoulders, comforting her poor baby boy, she starts to scold us as we explain what really happened, obviously not believing a word we're saying. The whole time Edgy's player is interjecting with lies, getting more and more frantic as he realizes his story isn't making sense and getting more and more comforting shoulder rubs from Mama Jocasta. Finally, Edgy's player breaks down and starts screaming at Rango's player, who looks just about ready to fight him, and Jocasta turn all of her attention to him. She shushes him, holds him close to calm him down, and finally she kisses him. I'm not talking about a little sweet mama kiss on the forehead, I'm talking about a kiss between lovers with passion. I'm pretty sure there was tongue involved. Yikes. In that moment, everyone kind of freezes and stares until GM shouts, Hey, yo! and starts running. I mean, absolutely booking it towards our stuff in the door. A moment later, everyone follows suit and we all frantically gather up our stuff before literally sprinting out the door and down the street. We never stopped, never talked about what was going on. We didn't even look back. We were just a couple of people sprinting off into the evening to escape the horrors we just witnessed. We didn't stop until we reached me and GM's apartment. We all just rushed in and frantically tried to make sense of what happened. It was impossible, and soon enough, Mouse, Gyro, Rango, and Ditz went home, leaving me to write up this report on the strange events of what is now yesterday's evening. The situation is still unfolding. We have had no word from Edgy's player, even though we've been texting him all night. Also, Mouse forgot her laptop at his house in the sheer panic of the event, so we have to go get back everything somehow. I'll try to keep you all updated with edits as more happens, but for now, I must rest my mind to avoid any permanent psychic damage I may have sustained after seeing whatever that was. There is no moral to this story except the common sense of please do not randomly ask women for nudes and don't snog your mother. Also, if you have any ideas as to how to get that laptop back, please do tell. I'd rather it be the Sandlot style with as little interaction as possible, as there is no way we're stepping back into that layer of that beast. Edit number one. It was decided that if Edgy doesn't respond by midday today, about half an hour from now, the, the guys from our group, me, GM, and Gyro, would just go and get it, making sure to record everything if there's a problem. Edit number two. Yeah, this isn't going to need a part two. Things have gotten a little more criminal. Busy right now, I'll update as soon as I can. And the update never came. I can only imagine what happened. Oh man, does that mean you broke into the house to get the laptop? Oh man, I'm not sure. What a weirdo. The thing I don't understand is you said it yourself. Everyone knew each other except for Edgy, and obviously Edgy was unknown to everyone, but yet you all decided to go to his house and play the game? I mean, I guess it's not that weird, but it's just, it seems something's not right. Obviously, <laughs> what a story that was. Just some dude making out with her mom is just disgusting and terrible. And yeah, I would have, I would have ran out as well, but um, hopefully everything got to normal. We haven't heard from you, so I'm assuming you're in jail. That's unfortunate. Well, that's all the tales for today. If you'd like to hear more, come back and I shall tell you something.